So welcome everyone. Um, this is the first session of our Senior Center Seminar Humanism in this content. Um, welcome as well to our instructor, Professor Vazir Nagarstani, who I think most of, of us already know, who is a philosopher and has contributed extensively to journals and anthologies and lectured at numerous international universities and institutes. His current philosophical project is focused on rationalist universalism, beginning with the evolution of the modern system of knowledge and advancing toward contemporary philosophies of rationalism, rationalism, their procedures, as well as their demands for special forms of human conduct. He's the author of Cyclonopedia and Intelligence and Spirit. And I will just um, read for you the description of our seminar before giving the word to Professor Reza. Um, so from intellectuals who proudly identify themselves as speech Marxists to critical theorists who are willing to endorse an uncritical materialist thesis in order to distance themselves from all strains of humanism, conservative or not, to scientists who find reprieve for their questionable political alliances and their cozy accounts of nature, and finally to philosophers who feel the need to sacrifice a little bit of their uncompromising thoughts in favor of being accepted by their academic and political allies. The intellectual landscape we're living in is, by all accounts, bleak. The so-called post-pandemic era has not even begun, but considering the sheer lack of theoretical and practical will and imagination that has gone into combating it, it is safe to say that we have not seen anything yet. The indiscriminate assault on the concept of the human has led us to an impasse where the emancipatory left increasingly displays the characteristics of an impoverished street activism that cannot even combat the anti-vaxxer crowd. While some assume that we should enrich our thoughts with a little bit of contingency or some ineffable outside component here and there, the ambition of this seminar is to revive the unexplored movement within the concept of the human towards its rational inhuman, that is to say, its historically critical ends. A selection of texts, oh yes, and we, the selection of texts that we will be reading, I think um, everybody got it in the syllabus, so I think that's um, okay for now. Um, with all that said, I finally give the word to Professor Reza. Please take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, glad to see you all here. Uh, so uh, as usual, uh, um, the first thing that we do, uh, we do introduction. I understand that uh, if we are going to introduce, everyone is going to introduce themselves uh, today, there would be no class whatsoever. Uh, so I would say that uh, how about um, our great moderator <coughs> uh, passed through uh, people who were part of the, you know, the actual, uh, class, uh, you know, the people who were supposed to present uh, in the actual class, and then if they can introduce themselves or any other person who wants, uh, uh, we start from the introduction, then I will start with, with some introductory remarks. I chart out um, a couple of uh, set of problems uh, that are going to be the cornerstone uh, of what we are going to talk about uh, for, the past, for the next few sessions. Obviously this class, the more I have thought about it, I thought that uh, you know, uh, this is not something that uh, I should have ever uh, touched uh, precisely because within this, and I would say, and I will say uh, why, uh, within this sort of problematic, there are so many uh, <clears throat> auxiliary rabbit holes. Um, and there is always a different point of view uh, um, that you can use uh, in order to approach uh, this, this problem. But uh, nonetheless, I think that uh, if this is going to be an introductory course on series of problems that have been somehow uh, I wouldn't say plaguing, but uh, suffusing and uh, disturbing in a positive way philosophy, uh, critical philosophy since the time of um, Kant and probably even uh, earlier Hume, Locke and Descartes, uh, then we will do whatever uh, we can and everyone uh, 
you know, uh, essentially, we are providing a set of pointers that everyone can use to create other sorts of pointers in order to approach this problem sufficiently. But nevertheless, in so far as the nature of the problem is quite serious and consequential, um, I think that uh, we cannot remain silent about it. So uh, shall we start with introductions? I mean, um, my dear sir, you take the uh, basically helm and move through uh, people, introductions. <clears throat> Well, uh, I think I, I can start with introduce, introducing myself, for I am also um, a certificate student enrolled for the class. So I'm I'm your moderator as well for everybody. Um, I'm Mateus Ferreira. I'm a philosopher student at uh, the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and I'm also uh, my advisor is Professor J. P. Caron. For those of you who know him, and yes. I'm happy to be here. I promise not to take too much time talking. Um, yeah, keep going, guys. Who wants to go next? Reza, you already know me, and everybody else who doesn't know me, you'll know me in a while. Um, my name's on the bottom. Yes, I know you quite well, but no, you should introduce yourself. That's my introduction. <laughs> Just for the scare factor. Introduction, so I'm, I don't want to say anything about myself. Um, yeah, that's it. Please, uh, please don't worry. Uh, I mean, just essentially the introduction, who you are, why did you take this class and uh, what your background is? So I can actually have a, a clue, uh, you know, what sorts of level, uh, how I should oscillate between this sort of talk and that sort of talk. <clears throat> okay, can I? Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Can, you, can anyone hear yes, me? Yes, absolutely. All right, good. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mateus Lazarotto. I'm a philosophy undergraduate uh, enrolled in the Federal University of Pernambuco in Brazil. Um, not much to say. Uh, I'm very interested in this class. Uh, I coordinate a study group uh, in Brazil with Zanab de Almeida. Some, some of you may know him. Uh, and we have uh, some contributors who, who are uh, who also make part of the new center to some extent. Uh, Jean-Pierre Cajon and Cassia come to mind right now, but there are many others. And um, I, I, I'm interested in this class. Uh, well, I, I'm in general, I'm interested in, in irrationalism and uh, uh, some, of, some of our study groups in, uh, inside my study group uh, are actually studying neo-rationalist thought. Uh, also have uh, sub-study groups uh, regarding organizational theory and political economy, as well as mathematics and computation. So I'd say those are my overall interests uh, in contemporary philosophy in general. So yeah, I, I guess is it. Uh, happy to be here. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Yeah, so I'll, I'll follow um, Aaron's suggestion and, and go on my, my list. Um, so Aaron is the first in the list. Please. Uh... Sure. Yeah, so I'm Aaron. Um, I am, after a long absence, back in New York. Um, I'll keep it short and just say this is the class I've always wanted Reza to teach. Uh, it's sort of a um, philosophical anthropology. So I'm, I'm pretty excited for it. And my background is sort of German literature and uh, political science. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, <clears throat> next, Erica, please. Uh, hello, my name is Erica Deal. Um, I'm a painter, 
And I'm in rural Ohio right now, but I'll be in Rome in a few weeks and life will be so much better. I'm taking this class because I'm interested in new ways of thinking about the world that I'm living in right now. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I think that should be David Uriel. Mm -hmm. Hi there. Um, I don't, I don't like today. Sorry about that. But can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't have much of a background in philosophy. Uh, much of like a professional training background. I just read a lot of it on my own. I'm interested in philosophers like Marx and uh, in the analytic tradition like uh, Brandom and Sally Haslinger, and in general people who take social relations seriously. Um, and I'm excited to take this course because uh, I read The Labor of the Inhuman a long time ago and was very intrigued by it. And this uh, seems like it'll follow up on those themes. So uh, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Um, then we would have Kenneth. Get your bone. Hi, uh, my name is Kenneth. Uh, I'm in, an artist in New York. Excuse me. Um, and uh, yeah, I would say I'm here and doing this program and in this class because a lot of my work um, is in the interest of how knowledge is useful <laughs> and what's the difference between knowledge and coordination. And is there such a thing as objective coordination? Um, can we tell the difference, et cetera? Um, so yeah, so excited to learn more and meet more people. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, kind of would have. Pablo Aguilar. Hello, everyone. I'm Pablo. I, um, I'm in Mexico City right now. Well, always. Um, I have a background in architecture theory uh, and some philosophy. I'm an architect, but I, 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 I took a lot of classes in the philosophy departments. Um, and I'm interested in this class because <clears throat> uh, I've always had like I've always had like a very skeptical view of humanism understood in the classical sense, um, and I've just been always really critical of of some of its some of its consequences, or at least like um, I don't know how to put it more more eloquently. The thing is, I uh, I just I'm here because I hope that this course, the seminar, will help me to um, just articulate way better a, a criticism of of humanism, again understood in, in its more classical sense. So I'm excited to be here and happy to meet you all. This is my second course at the New Center, so my second seminar. So I'm 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 still I'm still feeling that. And I know what your excitement. first seminar was. Uh, it was the myth of the master with Jason. Yes, uh, it's okay. still okay. going on, and it's blowing my mind. It's very, very good. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, <clears throat> I couldn't hear. Are you talking about me? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Sorry. All right. Fine. So hi, everyone. Hi, friends. So I'm Gyokan. I'm from Istanbul. I have a, B a MA in comparative literature. I'm interested in longevity and blockchain technologies. So I'm here because I like Reza, Reza and I just want to understand why I quit academy like five years ago. That's all. I think that both of those uh sources of curiosity are misplaced. Great that you actually quit academia and it's very sad that you like my work. <laughs> but I great quit, job you go on. <laughs> I also quit smoking a month ago. <laughs> That's all. Love you. Love you too. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, now, Alfredo, please. Hi. I am Alfredo from Mexico City as well. I'm a applied mathematician and artist uh, uh, doing artistic research in 
things like social uh, science, uh, microbiology, and the interest uh, in the social epistemology and the construction of utopian thought. So that's why I'm interested in this course to get uh, inspire inspiration and like, new ideas. Yeah. Thank you so much. Right. Then we have here um, Rodolfo, I think. Hi, uh, I'm Rodolfo Sousa. Uh, I am Mexican as well, but I live in the in uh, in Jalapa, <coughs> another city, and I am an artist as well. Um, but I work with the erosion of the images, and I work with gossip and with the uh, gaps between communication. And I guess that's my main interest in life. Uh, and I'm, I'm really, uh, yeah, that's, that's all I, I have to say right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, um, Gabriela Rosenberg. Hi, uh, you can call me Gabby. Um, I'm so excited to take this class. I'm a painter in Los Angeles and I just felt that it was gonna be really beneficial to my practice. Um, and this is my first course at the New Center. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabby. Um, so now we have Alexander Sayden. Uh, hi, it's me. Uh, I'm also in Los Angeles. Uh, my background is in art and fabrication. Um, I'm excited to take this class because I think I'm interested about kind of recent developments around humanism and you know it's it's many uh, diverse enemies. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, now we have. Max, I guess. Uh, yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Sir, my name is Max Valenciic. Uh, you hear me? Yeah. And I'm a certificate student at the New Center. Otherwise, I study, I'm finishing my studies in media studies at the University of Ljubljana, Slovenia. And um, I'm managing editor of Schum Journal, and my interests lie in accelerationism, neo-rationalism, and non-standard philosophy. And for example, recently I was inspired by work of Davor Loeffler and his new conception of I don't know what technology is or how can we understand it. Super. By the way, if uh... Some of you don't know Shun Journal. I absolutely recommend it. It's one of the best, most brilliant journals that's being published these days. It's S with uh, the accent on top, U N. Um, so now it's um, Emily Viewmaster. Uh, Emil Wuma, or I uh, sorry, I couldn't quite. That's it. Yeah. That must That's... probably be that. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Easy pay. No, no, no worries. Um, hi, I'm Emil. Uh, I'm from Wellington, New Zealand. Uh, if I trail off a bit or get a bit distracted during class, it's three thirty in the morning here. I'm trying my best. Um, I uh, do fashion. I studied at Massey University in Wellington doing fashion, art, and communications. Uh, I got a sort of hobby of philosophy, and I'm starting to get involved with uh, sort of accelerationist critiques. I'm interested specifically about accelerationists, or specifically Brizard's analysis of contemporary politics was... To me, it seems like accelerationism is the radical wing of economism. And I want to know what political solutions they offer to contemporary uh, political discontents. Um, I'm also very involved with 
sort of contemporary Marxism around Wellington. And I am involved with the Wellington Workers Education Association. Um, and I've done some work based off Reza's, um, done some artwork uh, sculpture based off Reza's uh, demonology course. And it's not, this is my first time with uh, the new school for the uh, new center for research and practice, uh, my first course, but I've been following for a while. So I'm very excited for this course. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And of course, uh, you know, um, philosophy is not an excuse to lose the sleep. Essentially, I would be disappointed in any person who actually chooses philosophy over sleep by principle. <laughs> Right then, um, I think we have Dylan, Dylan Botag. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Dylan, and I'm from Texas. Um, I studied art in undergrad and I've been taking new center classes since like 2015. Um, I'm basically like a wannabe autodidact and I'm interested in uh, left accelerationism and pretty much everything like ergonomic adjacent. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. Uh, thank you so much. Great to have you here again. Thanks. Um, now we have uh, Ivan Loginov. Hi there. Um, I'm a PhD student in philosophy and history of science. I'm also interested in theoretical biology and uh, work as a researcher at the Center for Theoretical Study in Prague, uh, uh, where I work on sound studies. Uh, <clears throat> here I'm enrolled as a certificate student in critical philosophy. So I'm here just because I'm interested in contemporary critical philosophy, right? Superb, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, have here now Eduardo Camargo. Hi everyone, uh, I am Eduarda. I live in Curitiba, Brazil. I am a visual artist and researcher, uh, graduated by the Universidade Estadual do Paraná. And my interest on this course is based on an interest that I have of fiction, history, and mythology, and also to have a more nuanced and better elaborated critique of humanism. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, I also have here Sean Francis. Yeah, hi. Uh, so I'm Sean, and um, can you hear me? <clears throat> Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so I'm Sean. Uh, I'm in and from Singapore. I'm currently doing my master's at the National University of Singapore in critical theory. Um, I primarily work in continental philosophy, specifically in the areas of metaphysics and metaphilosophy, currently doing my dissertation on trying to construct an ontology slash nuology of style through Deleuze. Um, and I'm in this class because I think I'm interested after hearing all of the critiques, the relentless critiques of humanism and the subject and man, uh, interested in hearing a positive account of what exactly the, the subject is or what man is or what humanity is, um, you know, beyond mere like empty sets or becoming. So, yes. Okay, we have a delusional skeptic in at our midst. <laughs> that's good, that's good. Um, I want to Nima Bareman. Nima Bahana. Hi, everyone. Yes. My name is, yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nima. I'm from Iran, living in Boulder, Colorado, somewhere in the mountain. And uh, background in art, and in my art practice, I deal with. Did we lose Nima? I have Zanagar State, it's Boulder. Okay. Um, I think I think the last one. Nima, you, you got cut me? off. I think you got cut off. Uh, I'm sorry. For a uh, let me. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, 
yeah. So I said that I live in the mountain and I'm so excited for the next week because we are going to have Reza here and see you Boulder. And yeah. yeah. I'm much looking forward to <laughs> Thank you so much, Nima. Thank you. Um, next is Akshat Kare. Hello, am I audible? Yes. Um, so I'm a novelist and a poet. And I'm from New Delhi. And um, I'm mostly uh, all over accelerationism. And as a matter of fact, my recent novel is actually an attack on it. But um, as far as contemporary philosophy goes, because I'm from India, Iran is right on, right there. And uh, Jason's work, Reza's, um, Reza's work has been very interesting to me. And a lot of it uh, largely because they also interact with a lot of the writers that I like, like uh, Sadek Hidayat and Hassan Blasim. So I'm really interested to see uh, what this course has in store for me. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> And then next one would be Selma Puskaya. Hello, um, I'm Selma. I'm curator and researcher based in Berlin. Um, originally, I come from Bosnia and Herzegovina, where I graduated in art history and comparative literature at Faculty of Philosophy, University of Sarajevo. Um, I've also attended postgraduate program in curatorial practices at Koldo Magazan, and um, I hold masters in media art cultures. Um, at universities in Austria, Denmark, Poland, and Hong Kong. Um, I'm also co-founder of the New Liquidity Interdisciplinary Research Platform for Artistic and Curatorial Practices. And um, the reason why I'm interested in this seminar is because I've already uh, done quite a lot of research on posthumanism, and one of my master theses was on posthuman body perspectives. And basically, I would like to expand my uh, research, and this is my first week at uh, the new center as certificate student. So I'm quite excited to be here. Thank you. Pleasure is mine. Thank you so much. Great to have you here. Uh... Yeah, um, Raza, I'm, I'm going around the list and then I just noticed that we still have something like 18 more people. So I Okay, so how about this? Are we just volunteer our greatest students to introduce, uh, you know, uh, in case that, um, particularly if you're coming from either an extremely different background than what we have uh, had so far, art, philosophy, or if you are actually take, have taken this class for very specific philosophical or artistic reason, you know, just hitting people, with blunt Actually, philosophical objects or something like that. I, I do have a specific reason for taking this course that um, uh, ties into my overall reason for um, wanting to get involved in the new center, which is that um, as a software engineer and studying computer science in college, I was really, all my bad grades were in computer science, all my good grades were in philosophy. And after undergrad, trying to do political organizing, I was really inspired by Paulo Freire's work on um, critical pedagogy. Um, but keeping up philosophy as kind of a hobby in the background, as I delved into it and the questions of how in practice do we raise class consciousness if you're a Marxist or learn in general, et cetera, um, and comparing uh, whatever I was studying with Freire and his humanism, uh, I kept finding it so hard to find like a good theoretical grounding for those, uh, all of those important questions about critical pedagogy and consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to come to the new center to, and, and this class in particular to like revisit humanism itself and build up like the new theoretical tools and discipline and skills for myself to be able to research questions of that nature and maybe push something new forward. Yes. Well, uh, most probably this class is going to disappoint you fundamentally. Um, the reason, as I mentioned that, uh, so 
this is something that I have noticed that, you know, as someone who had engineering background, philosophy, and always I'm interested. The thing is that with philosophy, it always, it's not, it's, I'm not demanding that everyone be a philosopher, right? But there is a threshold at which you cross to a certain sort of questions. And those questions are not provided methodologically by certain other disciplines. Your fall into the rabbit hole of philosophy is inevitable. And then you cannot take it uh, or keep it at the background as something that, this is like my basically base camp and I'm going to navigate, venture out the uh, wilderland or the desert of whatever uh, sort of topic you are uh, trying to explore. Precisely because there would a fundamental discontinuity emerges between these two ideals of uh, researching in your field, which is respectable in itself, and those sorts of extremely um, nebulous, demanding, and oftentimes esoteric, not esoteric in an occult sense, but esoteric in the sense that the nature of these problems is not obvious to us at sometimes either, right? So there is, there is this sort of thing that I would say that precisely this class, what it's going to do is to kind of start to flesh out the nature of this problem such that you cannot leave philosophy on the background as a hobby or as a base camp. You need to have to take it with yourself, with all its goddamn sweating baggage and so on and so forth. But superbly, superb introduction. Thank you so much. I mean, I can pick two or three people um, and then we will have a break, a five minutes break, and we come back and we start uh, in good spirit. Um, Catherine, I mean, Catherine, as, as far as I know, has a very uh, peculiar background. Hi, yes, hi everyone. Um, yeah, I, I did my first degree in philosophy um, in the US. Um, now I work as a curator. I'm also a graduate student at CCS Bard. And um, my specific reason for taking the course is my research is now looking a lot at techniques um, and cultural techniques. So uh, I think this course should be quite relevant to that or at least extensions of that. Um, so I'm very excited to be here. Thanks. Thank you so much. And please, any person who wants to introduce themselves on those uh, principles, uh, feel free so. Um, if not, um, I mean, there are so many good people I know uh, here, I've been, uh, I've been working with uh, either through consultation, uh, Paige, Zenobio, all of, all of you guys. Uh, Carol, however, is the first, time that he's actually here uh, and I know him through social media and some uh, stuff here and there. Maybe you should introduce yourself. Oh, but I'm just a cheapskate lurker, I'm afraid. Um, I'm an English teacher, so I've just finished teaching. That's kind of why, why I couldn't sign up properly. I'm but that is not exactly your background. You have certain sorts of interests that are quite That's... specific. Okay, I'm a, a PhD student in human computer interaction, which I approach through um, Soviet psychology and um, mixing that with the philosophy of Ray Brescia uh, as well. Um, and yeah, uh, interested in uh, Reza's work, um, uh, like what he's doing um, at the moment in Carnap, although I don't like Carnap. Uh, <laughs> no one likes Carnap, but oh, let's, let's put it away for now. <laughs> um, our Iranian mafia, you know, I know there's some Iranians there, you're not going to name them. Yes, we are talking to you. <laughs> if you want to introduce yourself. And then of course, Maria, Zenobio, Cassia, uh, my dearest friends. I think uh, Sahaj has his hand raised. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, so I, I actually have a, a kind of political uh, reason to uh, take this course with you. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, 
so the like i kind of see the human as this exclusionary concept and essentially the kind of uh, like you know essentially uh, what's happening in india right now is like there's this kind of uh, dehumanization process is happening very through bureaucratic systems you know where like minorities are being targeted and like you know sort of uh, fundamental rights are being revoked and uh, i see this as an extension of the humanist project itself like you know where first people are kind of deemed less than human and then you know all sorts of violences are like enacted upon them uh, and i do think that the, the human form is essentially like hollow right now and like i mean uh, i'd like to think through what comes next essentially that that's and uh, yeah your reza your work has like had a profound influence on me like and it's a honor to thank study you. with thank you so much so, thank you thank you very much okay my dear friends uh oh kasia uh, puts her introduction there uh on the sidebar uh feel free uh before uh having a short break uh introduce yourself otherwise Andrew? We'll have a, yes, absolutely, Paige. Hi, um, my name's Paige. I am an artist based in Tongva land known as Los Angeles. My work explores the ecological body and its interactions with a focus on where infrastructures of world building intersect with practices. And this exploration has a lot of intersections and interests in, in humanism. Um, and I do not have any philosophy background. Good, good. Good, excellent. Thank you so much. We, we, I know that we have talked about some of our stuff in the past. <laughs> uh, anyone else before the break? If not, let's have a five minutes break. I mean, the first session is always uh, looks like this. Uh, the eleven thirty uh, will only have one hour to actually talk about stuff. Uh, so just have a uh, five uh, to eight minutes break, then reconvene. Okay, see you now.
Emil, were you trying to drop it in? Is that what you were doing? Yeah, I was trying, but um, okay. But no, because I can't figure out what my Google email thing is so. My Google Drive, I can probably get it off my Google Drive, but I'm going to have to guess my password a few times. Um, and my Dropbox thing. If I could just drop it in the chat. Yeah, you can probably drop it in here. Did you try that? I did. I did. I'll try it again. Maybe that'll just... work again. I'll yeah, drag and drop. Um, but it's like the first thing if you search up Leotard and Human. And it's got nice little annotations on the thing. And you can... You can select the text, so I imagine you can control V. It's great. It's a good reading. I was like really enjoying it. Um, yeah. I'm gonna try, I'll try to drive again. Connect. You said reflections on time uh yeah there's yeah that's a real real useful thing for me <laughs> kind of helped me i think he's i'm gonna take a stab in the dark but i think he's kind of going to like a kantian critique of time mediated and cognition and reconstructed or maybe taking Kant further he's, apparently he's known to be like a postmodern return to Kant. Okay. Not that trend in, in in modern French philosophy. I'm just an autodidact guy who that likes doing it as a hobby. Just really enjoying as you say it. You're like, not me the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> a Discord classroom, but very good, Richard. Good suggestion. Uh, hold on. I'll try connect. If not, it'll be in the Google um, Classroom. Then I'll, I'll drop the PDF. Yeah, looks like it's going to have to be in the um, Google Classroom. Yeah, I just tried to do it too in there. Thanks for mentioning it. The opposite of a kitsch Marxist is a Gramscian. Sorry, this is for the chat. Um, okay, let's try and do the Google Classroom now. Discord classroom page. Classroom page.
Are we all back, perhaps? Upload file. Okay. I'm all good. We start. All right. God almighty, this is like, this is like fall and I've never seen such a hot sun in this wasteland on the East Coast. No, it's awful. I moved back here for fall and now we're not getting it. <laughs> no. I miss fall so much. After one fall, year, so. fall, fall on the east coast is not fall uh, like in Iran or some great land. Uh, it is essentially a recipe for depression. You can ask about that later. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm sure that people like Kirill who uh, live in London, they would actually laugh at this sort of stuff because they live in UK, right? Where basically you always have that sort of set up. I left the UK, Reza. Oh, you did? Finally left, yeah. I got out, like I was saying, I was going to for so long. Um, I, I live in Berlin now. I live on the very outskirts in Zell. Oh, oh my God. So you have joined uh, our great comrades at the news center and all those. Uh, the, one of the things about Berlin, I would say that I love that city, but my God. Yeah. <laughs> it is very, very, the very uh, source of hipsterism. Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I live on the outskirts for just this month, which gives me some distance. I actually went for a run the other day. And uh, I saw a bit of the Berlin Wall, but not like the Berlin Wall that divides Berlin, but the bit of the Berlin Wall that's- Well, that's the whole thing. The only thing that you can actually see is, is just part of the Berlin Wall. Otherwise, yeah. it wasn't Berlin Wall. wall. The slices, but no, but it's like the, the bit that separated um, West Berlin from East Germany. That's how far away I'm living from, like. Yes, I mean, uh, and, and you, you should understand that it's like people uh, who are Berliner, <coughs> West Germany, <coughs> was a hellhole, you know, before uh, thing. The only thing that made it interesting, that Western part, when uh, Eastern Europeans and the, the, the wall broke and the, those good people, those intellectuals and artists came and it started to mingle with the West, Western Germany and Western Berlin. Otherwise, Western Berlin was always like, just imagine like some sort of administrative nowhere land. Uh, that, that's that's always has been West Germany. The only reason that Berlin is interesting is precisely because of the people who came to it after the after the wall uh, uh, was taken down. Okay, shall we start now? <clears throat> Our uh, where is our moderator? Yeah. Should, should we start? <laughs> Let's go for it. Yes, please. Let's okay. Go for it. Uh, so, my dear friends, thank you so much for all the introductions. Uh, uh, I'm glad to have you here. Uh, as I mentioned, by virtue of the nature of, of this, uh, the topic that this class tries to cover, we're obviously going to disappoint a lot of you um, precisely because we won't be able to cover certain sort of answers or right questions that you were seeking before taking this class. Some of them might not be actually even discussed. And if you want to be discussed, then you have to uh, put that shyness away and ask me questions, right? Otherwise, we won't be able to do all of that. We can only do that if you actually participate. <clears throat> I know that uh, you think that, oh, well, I don't have a, a background in philosophy and stuff, but uh, who cares? Uh, you know, uh, essentially, you are trying to struggle with a question that even a philosopher might not be able to answer. But nevertheless, 
uh, we can start uh, to kind of claw at that sort of question and see if there, there might be a sort of answer for now. Uh, all in all, the trajectory of this class is very simple. I am trying to anchor the problem very specifically in a certain uh, problem emerged uh, from the advent of uh, critical modern philosophy, particularly Kant. This is obviously, uh, you might say that, oh, Reza is being selected here and there are other sorts of philosophy. Yes, I know that. But I would say that uh, by virtue of the systematic systematicity that goes into how Kant formulates certain sort of problems to which we have either answered or to which we have made certain answers, but they were not legitimate answers. I think this is a good starting point. And then we will take it from there. Essentially, we are going to start warning, I'm using a very bad word here, with the question of what man is. Now, what I is talking about here, I am using, this is for this session, probably a couple of next sessions, I will talking about the question of man. What is man? Famous question of Kant in lectures on logic. <clears throat> now, obviously this word man to many of us seems antiquated, rather problematic, or perhaps wholeheartedly problematic. Um, as a Farsi speaker, I don't have that much of a uh, reaction to this word, even though I understand that this word is extremely loaded in English at this point. Why I'm saying that as a Farsi speaker? Precisely because I know for the fact that the question of man, man, the word man, man means uh, basically Sanskrit, Avestan, Pahlavi uh, origins uh, coming from India and, and uh, Persia. Uh, it is not actually about male species. We are not talking about male species by any sort of uh, male gender or whatever uh, of that sort of stuff. We are not even talking about an individual, so to speak, for now. I will talk about individuals. We are talking about mortal. Mortal is the root of the word man. But mortal, you might ask, say that, well, birds are mortal, right? Animals mortal, trees are mortal. Then why is that uh, we are applying this word to human beings? Precisely because <clears throat> The origin of this word, which was hijacked by Germanic Teutonic philosophy, <clears throat> is more thought by virtue of you understanding the fact of your own mortality. To come to grips to the, with the facts of being mortal used to be uh, a standard to distinguish humans from non-humans. Precisely because that fact of mortality, once you come to grips with it and you treat it as an actual subject matter of reflection, brings you to certain other sort of consequences, which might not be available to other sorts of animals. And we are also animals. The fact that we can draw, derive values, systems of axiology, uh, practical and theoretical reasoning out of that sort of fact that we are mortal, 
It's quite uh, astonishing to the ancients. In fact, they think that if we, if we did not have a reflective, self-reflective encounter with the fact of our own mortality, being mad, being man, being mortal, it would be, we would be just like anything else, right? It would be just like a rock. So there is, a, there is I wanted to say that even though the word mensch, man, and stuff in the philosophy uh, with the beginning of, uh, you know, uh, late 17th century, take from a very neutral Sanskrit Avestatian meaning, take a, take a rather chosen people connotation or male-oriented species or patriarchal stuff, that does not really uh, destroy the fact that this word originally came to European culture as precisely in its fundamental understanding within Eastern cultures, right? For, for fidelity to Kant, <clears throat> and also fidelity to the subsequent attacks on Kant in contemporary times in terms of races, questions of racism, gender, so on and so forth. When it comes to Kant, and perhaps Hume, or even Darwin, we will use the word man. As precisely that ambiguous word that might be riddled with fundamental biases, contemporary biases that began to emerge in European culture, or even they existed there in the Eastern cultures to begin with, but also with a uh, understanding of the origin of the concept. This is, uh, it was, this was a digression, but I just wanted you to know, uh, so you don't say that Reza used the word man against, uh, as, as opposed to human, just first this session, out of blue. Uh, <clears throat> as we move forward, we start to talk about the concept of the human, as we move toward this sort of period of historical philosophy. I, would say, I wouldn't say that uh, Aaron said a shockingly Heideggerian digression. I would say that this is more rather a Schopenhauerian digression on the fate of man. <laughs> uh, um, so let me begin with a sort of I have already, this is what I wanted to say, that already I have, essentially this class is my idea, right? And I will try to be best as possible to be uh, faithful to the history of philosophy. But essentially every sort of class that you ever take in philosophy, it is the product of ideas and motivations, sometimes explicit or ulterior motivations by the very person who teaches you philosophy. And yes, I have explicit motivation. I already know how the class is going to end, right? Just like a movie director. I know how to, this script is going to end and where I am going to take it. It is up to you to try to hijack it from me. And if you don't, then I have no problem to simply take where it should, according to my own philosophical uh, convictions, it should go. Simple as that. This is like any sort of philosophy class. You can hijack it and you can uh, convince me and other people that this is not actually the, the real course. Of course, we are going to get to fights and people who have taken my class, they know that there are certain moments that classes become extremely intense. 
that I, what I love about philosophy. <clears throat> Obviously, the end of the class would be that Kant was right, but not entirely. And we have go through a huge amount of material to understand why Kant was right, but not entirely, or why Kant touched upon a certain sort of problem that neither post-humanism, anti-humanism, Marxist humanism, Marxist anti-humanism at all, because have never managed to touch in its entirety. Questions, reactions before we just start. I have something. I don't know if it's too much for now, but no, go on, Cassia. Rereading the text uh, for today's class, I was thinking about precisely the thing that you start mentioning that is death. Uh, and this is a very important theme for me. And I was wondering uh, how much of the importance attributed to Nigredo as you attribute to in, in the text that you wrote uh, to Collapse, uh, how much of this importance of Nigredo as a coupling of the living soul with the dead body in the necrophilic intimacy persists in what we see today as some kind of Promethean or new rationalist thought? And if, the, if, does, if Nigredo does constitute something different than uh, merely an object, an object of comparison to a robust metaphysics of the idea of the age, or, or, or does it mean uh, something more in the context of the prehistory of intelligence? Because I was uh, paying attention to the occurrences of death uh, in the in the text uh, by Wolfendale, and I and I was correlating with what I have seen you uh, wrote, uh, write about uh, death and uh, five occurrences called my attention. That is, uh, that are the the death of God, the death of man, uh, extinction, but uh, more closely to what Brassier uh, was doing in, in Nihil Unbound, uh, Nigredo uh, in your text in Collapse, and existential risk. That is something that you developed more in the end of Intelligence and Spirit. So I was thinking if something like the uh, an explication of the concept of death is possible or even desirable, and how death, death fits in the, con in the con general context of humanism. Sure. Uh, and you see, when I wrote that article, I was just a drooling baby in its cradle. Um, so um, I have, I've rethought about it. In fact, I've been rethinking about it in a, in a different sort of uh, problem, uh, the problem of heterogeneity that we are going to talk about either this session or next session that is actually part uh, of one of the main problems of what is man in, a, in, in Kant's sense of what is the human being. Um, the problem with heterogeneity is that how can you have mind and body together such that mind actually knows that there is a body uh, to which it, it is attached or vice versa or so on and so forth, all sorts of variations. It's called the problem of heterogeneity, uh, goes as far as uh, rational, meta meta uh, rational metaphysics of, of Christian Wolf and Leibniz, and even perhaps uh, elder uh, philosophers. This is for me, it's actually quite this whole idea of coupling of mind and body, which is problem of heterogeneity is actually a part of the problem of theory of knowledge. Uh, it's, it's quite uh, central, yes, to, to this sort of stuff that we are going to talk about. Uh, the problem of extinction, existential risk, so on and so forth, to me, belong to a different sets of problems when it comes to, when it comes to this idea that if we manage to explicate the idea of death 
or mortality, there would be different sorts of concepts of risk and uncertainty and stuff. And each of them have their respectable uh, philosophical questions and philosophical weight. Um, uh, but I would say that precisely because of the nature of this class, I wouldn't be able to talk about them that much. But the problem of heterogeneity, the coupling of mind and body in a canonical sense, uh, is also an offshoot of the problem of death. But in a very specific sense, precisely because it creates problems within the theory of knowledge itself in, in a Kantian sense. I will talk about this uh, within, the, within the context of the history of philosophy. Uh, Aaron. So uh, a question that's, I think, always important um, is what you see as the, uh, the sort of stakes in this debate. Obviously, there are a lot of directions that you can go in, uh, and it's a huge question, the sort of stakes of critiquing or defending humanism from certain kinds of critique. Um, but I guess you could answer that in a general or a more specific philosophical sense. And I think it's always a, like a really important question to you, ask. You, you, can, you can always have with any sort of problem, mm. you know, the philosophers have a trick in up their sleeve that uh, they start to answer it generally first. And then when they get uh, into some sort of serious danger situation, they start to actually uh, answer it specifically. I would say that I will do exactly, this is what I didn't want to say to spoil mm -hmm. the whole idea of the class for you who have taken it as if I'm going to talk about some other sort of stuff. Unfortunately, the whole idea of the class is simply the explication of the concept of philosophical anthropology mm -hmm. as Kant understood it. Mm -hmm. Good. And then my question is precisely is sort of why does that debate matter or what, yeah, what can we get from this that... That, that debate that? matters precisely because the moment that we understand that there are open wounds or open problems within the problem of philosophical anthropology, and I would actually argue that yes, Foucault, Althusser, so on and so forth have seen parts of that, but you cannot actually see the entirety of the problem if you sidestep the problem. And to not sidestep the problem, you should take Kant seriously. So as Hegel's uh, uh, critique of Kant, but ultimately that what makes humanism in that sort of what I what you call it inhumanism, whatever, I don't care. I really mm -hmm. don't care. I would say just with humans, you know, for the sake of brevity. I would say that hum that's what makes humanism an important, an extremely unexplored question. Um, this is uh, you you already know that. I mean. Philosophers have the habit, and this is the same thing with Kant uh, uh, and any sort of philosopher, Plato particularly, um, but, but all philosophers. So uh, the question of what is man uh, is being posed by Kant in lecture, in, uh, in lecture on logic. And uh, before that, there is a really sharpened text called anthropology from a pragmatic point of view. I think it's 1798. 1798, uh, lecture on logic is 1800. And then before all of this is critical pure reason, if I'm not mistaken. The thing is that in critical pure reason, he's already said that my reason, it can't say so if paraphrasing the, the real code to be discovered. My reason has always been be set upon uh, my reason uh, has always, whether a speculative or, uh, uh, or theoretical or practical, has always be set upon three questions. What do I know? 
What should I do? And what should I hope for? Right? This is the critique of pure reason. That is the, 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 for him, is the ultimate ground of any sort of idea of reason and philosophy in a, in a, in a respectable critical sense, right? But then a few years after this, by way of uh, the pragmatic uh, uh, anthropology, by way of the pragmatic point of view, and then lecture on logic, the question of what is man, he starts to notice that there are some really extremely disturbing problems upon which he has stumbled and he has not solved them. And this is where the story of this class begins. Kant is sitting as always, if he's not actually uh, uh, basically walking across the neighborhood, going to the, uh, to the pub that he always does, He's sitting and he's looking back at his writings, just like all philosophers. And he sees that the circle of philosophy called revenge is still open. It's not closed yet. That he has stumbled on a question that he has not yet answered. And he thinks that this question is so monumental and momentous that if this question is going to be answered, we will definitely find ourselves encountered with the advent of a new conception of philosophy. And if we fail to do so, perhaps all of the philosophy that has come before it has been intellectually feeble in grappling with the consequences of what they are actually talking about. This is, uh, let me actually read the quotes for those of you who do not know the citation from this uh, part from Lectures on Logic. My apologies, Marcus, we will get back to you. Uh, sorry, my apologies. No, no, that was my question and basically sort of leading. So why don't we just start? <laughs> he says, the field of philosophy in its cosmo cosmopolitan meaning, you know, in the broadest sense, can be brought down to the following questions. One, what can I know? Two, what should I know? Three, what can I hope for? for what is man or the human? The first question is answered by metaphysics, the second by ethics, the third by religion, and the fourth by anthropology. Basically, however, all these could be counted to anthropology because the first three questions relate to the last one. Think about this, the first three questions, epistemology, ethics, religion. In critical pure reason for them, for, for, for Kant, is essentially whatever reason can talk to, right? What my, he says about my reason can actually uh, approach. Now, he, this is like a few years after, that he relegates the answering to all such questions, the first three one, epistemology, ethics, and um, epistemology, ethics, or what we call axiology, and then religion, relegated to the question of what is man, to the question of what he calls philosophical anthropology. Now, philosophers, throughout history have approached this uh, idea of how the first three questions relate to the fourth question, namely, what is man, what is human, in different sorts of ways. Some have thought that in answering the first three questions, one essentially answers the fourth question. What is the human? What is man? 
in answering what do I know, what should I do, what ought I to do, and uh, what can I hope for, I essentially answer the fourth question. But there are, have been certain kinds of philosophers also throughout history at post Kant. They have thought that, no, you can still answer rightfully to the first three questions of, not, of, of epistemology, ethics, axiology, or, uh, and, and religion, but still there might be a chance by the virtue of the nature of the fourth question, what is man, that you might not be able to answer the fourth question, even if you have answered correctly the first three questions. I belong to the second category. that I think that even if you answer correctly the first three questions, you might not still be able to answer correctly or even formulate the question which is the last one. What is the problem here? I mean, what is wrong with this guy? Wasn't the Critique of Pure Reason already a torturous enough book? Why is he besetting us to different sorts of problems? But as I said, that's unfortunately the job of philosophers. They are professional torturers of mind. <laughs> we should understand what is that that somehow disturb Kant, first of all, tease him to come up with this fourth question. And then most importantly, thinks that all the first three questions relate to the fourth question. So there are two horns of the problem here. What actually teased this man to come up with this fourth question? I mean, what was wrong with the first three questions? I mean, why? Couldn't you just leave us with those three questions? You have to go on and make a fourth one. And then they say that the three first three questions are relating to the fourth question. They screw you. Yeah. I saw that some people uh, raising their hands and stuff. I raised my hand. Yeah. Do you mean that I can ask my question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to the bathroom, but to have a question. <laughs> uh, my question was that how could you answer the first two questions right, correctly, and then answer the fourth question wrongly? Or in another way, what is the difference between these questions? Uh, do the three first question would entail human? And if not, uh, what is the surplus stuff? Well, th is it, th that's the whole point. Essentially, you are bringing to this, uh, let me uh, abbreviate, if I may so, uh, and please let me know if, if I'm uh, not correct. Essentially, you're asking that, uh, so we have two scenarios, answering the first two que uh, three questions, and uh, we will arrive naturally to the answer of the fourth questions. In the sense that the fourth question is the consequence of the first three questions. But how about the scenario within which the first three questions are subsumed are subsumed within the fourth questions, meaning that essentially what is man or what is the human has a surplus ace up its sleeve that it has not yet revealed. But the question will be, what is it? <laughs> no. Uh, that's what I would say that this is essentially you are trying to spoil as being a spoiler sport and you are revealing the entire scenario of my class here. 
think about this, and we are going to this, and uh, it's a, a extremely fascinating story. Uh, that sort of question of subsumption, we have already had it within Kant's canon. The relation between sens sensation and understanding within the edifice of productive imagination. That thing is a schematism. The subsumption of the sensory given under the concepts, right? And you remember Kant's way of basically talking about a schematism. I'm not going to spoil the entire thing, but Aaron, who I'm sure that is a Kant scholar and knows the, the German sources, knows already uh, what that a specific troubling thing about a schematism and imagination is when he talks about something from the deepest research, recesses of the soul. Go on, Aaron. <clears throat> oh dear, I'm not sure uh, I do, though I did take your Kant class and not all that deeply versed in Kant, but I, I mean, I guess it, it, it's that we can't know the, the soul or the freedom of the will, that, that, these are, that these are things we have to take on. Take on, but yes. This is, yeah, but this is the third question. Which yes. So when I'm having trouble formulating, right? One is the possibility of knowledge or what our capabilities are. Two is how we orient practices, uh, right? So we've got theoretical and practical reason. Uh, three is where I, where I stumble. What are we permitted to hope? And has to do with our sort of social intentions, right? Or our... our or the consequences of our values from which- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. In terms yeah. of value is the right way. Values, values. Yeah. So if I may say so, I'm not going to take questions. Someone said antinomy here. Now this is actually a very interesting question. We are just probably jump starting, but so be it. This is the first session, we can do that. But from next session, we are not flash forwarding. We are taking a step by step to go through all of this stuff. Someone said antinomy. Antinomy applied to God, human, or both. This is actually a very interesting word here, you know, that I'm not going to, again, you know, just like revealing all the uh, plot twists of this course. That yes, the question of what is man ultimately leads to a certain kind of antinomy. If ill formulated, if ill formulated, Cameron. Would you be able to, uh, don't worry, uh, if you can just, you don't need to turn on your camera, just turn on your microphone and just a little bit talk about this. Don't worry. Uh, Yes, there is a, there is a question of antinomy that I will I will um, I will get into that. But let me let me just go on. My apologies not to take uh, any more questions, uh, precisely because we had a little bit of a, a too much introductions and stuff which was necessary completely. But I need to at least get to certain kinds of problematics for the next session. So. As I said, in lecture and logic it comes with four questions, whereas in critical pure reason, he only comes with three questions. In his words, Kant says, all the interests of my reason, both speculative and practical, are united in the following three questions. What can I know? What ought I do to do? And what can I hope for? 
then obviously, if we are really interested in the question of what is the human in this sort of Kantian sense, we should ask ourselves how the fourth question manage to contain the first three. Either in the first sense that it is the consequences of the first three questions, epistemology, ethics, and religion or axiology. I mean, you can, you can, you can axiology here is quite vague here, the, 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 the system of values, right? Uh, so either the fourth question is simply the consequence of the three questions such that if you answer the first three questions, you arrive at the fourth question, or the fourth question is something fundamentally distinct within which the first three questions of epistemology, knowledge, uh, ethics, and religion, or system of axiology are subsumed. When we are dealing with a case of subsumption, we are essentially meaning that something subsumes some other things under itself precisely because it has something that other, other those things don't have, meaning that even if we have correctly answered the first three questions, we wouldn't still have arrived by virtue of answering those three questions with a correct answer to the fourth question. Let me start with the first three questions. Why is that actually in the critique of pure reason and even in earlier one, but part, particularly in critical pure reason, these three questions, first three questions, are so important to Kant. This brings us to a historical context of the emergence of such questions in philosophy. <clears throat> Does anyone know what is the source of trepidation of Kant? And particularly uh, the history of philosophy before Kant, that they begin to take such questions extremely seriously as opposed to post Aristotelian uh, pre critical philosophy. What is that source that? that enervates them, that makes them nervous, that such questions ought to be answered. If they cannot be answered, then the entire idea of human questioning about this source of stuff is in danger. Does anyone know? Well, the question, is the emergence of something we call the mechanistic worldview. The emergence of the new science of mechanics. The hardest blow ever given to a philosophy or pre-critical philosophy. So what does that actually do? You see, there is how Aristotelian worldview looked like, the great chain of being, right? Within the great chain of being, everything that is there, a shoe, a rock, you, your partner, God, maybe not God, some to think actually in our Aristotelian way, uh, a house. 
they are all actually at the same level, despite the idea that we always think about that there is a chain of being, like a ladder of being. The ladder of being is actually not really an accurate and picture of our Sotelian worldview in the in pre-critical pre worldview. Ladder simply means that there is a certain kind of ranking in nature or ranking. There is a ranking in, in great chain of being, but not in that sort of strong sense of ranking, like human is better than this, and the bird is better than worm, and worm is better than rock, and so on and so forth, right? And God is better than human, so on and so forth. Now, the great chain of being simply means that the appropriation of excellence to every sort of being is quite the same across the chain. What distinguishes them, a human from a rock, is the amount of this appropriation of excellence. So they're all under the same sort of appropriation of excellence. Appropriating excellence to something, to a worm, to a rock, to a house, to me, so on and so forth. Now, <clears throat> And the soul, of course, soul and the world and God, part of the great chain of being. Now, with the mechanic, with the me mechanics, the mechanistic worldview, this sort of worldview that we had is utterly annihilated. In Kant's words, Talking about the great chain of being, as in soul, world, and God, is no longer an object of scientific knowledge, but of the faculty of judgment, and hence impossible to be approached scientifically. But there is actually a far more, the Kant understood it, the British empiricists understood it, and the French rationalists understood it. There is a far more consequence to this. And that's, <clears throat> that consequence is quite simple. There is a distinction now between primary qualities and secondary qualities. Primary qualities that can be measured by and quantified by science and what you might call to be lowly rejectoid properties. And what are those lowly reject rejectoid uh, qualities or characteristics? Things like feelings, feels, emotions, thoughts, intentions, color, smell, pain, so on and so forth that completely annihilates a sort of worldview, renders it asunder. The mechanic, the, 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 the advent of scientific mechanics. Now, this creates a fundamental reverberation in the very theory of knowledge. What do I know? What should I hope for? What can I do? What is man? So, before moving forward, any questions? And we are, I think that we are getting close and I need, my apologies, for three last, uh, three sessions from now, actually four sessions, I have to go to somewhere 30 minutes uh, after the finishing of our class on, on time, uh, doctor appointment. After that, as usual, the classes can go on until 5 p.m. I don't care. Uh, but these four sessions, uh, I absolutely need to end them at 12.30. So um, I think that with these sorts of problematics that we have talked about, and I'm going to hone out this sort of problematics 
to, to arrive at why is that the question of what is the human? Is the source of all problems. But before then, we need to have certain kind of, with our great moderator, uh, certain sort of a standard for the next presentation. Precisely because the, the, you are a legion at this point, we cannot uh, let you to have just one presentation. We need three or four people to make presentation, no more than 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, you will be sorry, you will be cut short. Simple as that. Uh, so first and foremost, before I take the, the questions, uh, who are going to be victims of the next presentation, the first presentation? You should work together and you are going to go through introduction of Foucault on philosophical anthropology a la Kant and talk about some of this stuff. And I'm going to still talk about these next session as well and the session after work. Okay, Sean, we need two or three more volunteers. I could do it. Sure, excellent. Thank you, Pablo. So two, two more. Do we get to choose the presentations? Sorry? Do we get to choose uh, which are we going to present? No, you are not presenting individually. You are presenting collectively. Oh, uh, together. Okay. You have to you have to collaborate precisely because if, if everyone is trying to make a, a, an individual presentation, then no one actually manages to have a presentation, unfortunately, because of the size of the class. And also, this is a good exercise for dialects. <laughs> Dialect, dialectics from the back room. Um, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, Emil, uh, magnificent. Okay. If there is another person. These people should be actually given Medal of Honor because they are actually putting their feet on a landmine. I'm I'm not too scared of Foucault, but if it's if if there's a if there's an Alpha class or there's an Alpha presentation on his anti-humanism, I can yeah, pull yeah, in some sure. of the I mean, but as long as as long as it is within the context, and I know that also serve human controversies within the context. Essentially, what we want to formulate a presentation within the context of Kantian, the question of what is a human, right? And, and Althusser, I know that uh, uh, deals with that. So as uh, uh, basically um, Marx, Hegel, and Gramsci, and all, all sorts of people. My, my question is kind of, would I be able to bring Bajou into a, Bajou's ethics into a critique of Kantian ethics of, of the human ideal? That is not something for me to answer, unfortunately. Essentially. Precisely because you are not dealing with me firsthand. You are dealing with your collaborators. They might not decide to do that, right? <laughs> okay, we have it. I think um, we, have, we have four volunteers for the first presentation. You can make a very sexy uh, PowerPoint or not, or just like be very dry. It doesn't matter as long as it has philosophical substance. Uh, you are the first victims and you will be commemorated for what you have done. So, uh, I just want to think about what should we read next. I think that it's too early still to read the focal one because I 
because of the introduction, I couldn't actually manage through the, the actual problem that is at hand. We just got into a little bit of partially into what we might actually get at. Uh, no, I think that just like anyone who uh, uh, can suggest something, but uh, still Peter Wolfendale is great just to have a kind of an overarching idea of what all these sorts of stuff we are talking about. But there is, um, I, I cannot believe that I'm suggesting this. Uh, Pascal, right? As I said that, you know, always through my classes, we have set up, set, materials that we are going to, we have to, we have to use as resources, but we can also introduce new materials. Pascal passages uh, on, on mechanics and the new science of mechanics. Uh, they're quite damning on human homelessness. You know, the, the whole idea of human being home, humans being homeless, not having a home, comes from Pascal, not from Schopenhauer or any person. It's coming from Pascal. It's not coming from a, this sort of speculative realist terror drama. No, it is actually something much worse. So Pascal, if you want, if someone is want, wants to volunteer to actually get those passages, I uh, that would be great. Otherwise, I mean, uh, I have some, uh, Passages uh, uh, that I can uh, that I can actually tell you uh, which one actually you should read. Um, they're they're quite actually fundamentally strong and moving, um, and obviously uh, these are these are the sort of stuff uh, that absolutely uh, moved British empiricists and uh, can't eventually. Um, uh, just let me know, I mean, there is this, for example, I'm going to uh, read this uh, part for you from Pasco. You know, the question of heterogeneity, right? We have been talking about and how Pascal turns this heterogeneity of mind and body, understanding and sensation as a source of knowledge, right? This question being reposed after the advent of a new mechanics that renders asunder, uh, you know, second first qualities from secondary qualities the quantified from those which i said rejectoids in in the scientific sense like emotions and so on and so forth color smell and pain it says who would not think to see us give all things a mind and a body but we thoroughly understand this combination Yet it is the very thing that we understand least. Man is to himself the most miraculous object in nature, for he cannot conceive what matter is, still less what is mind, and least of all, how a body can be joined to a mind. You see, these are really the most damning inclinations of how something like today's anti-humanism or post-humanism might actually arise from the perennial questions about the question of what the human is. But as I said, don't get so high on this sorts of stuff because the plot twist is that Kant always, even though it would be a mutated Kant. So um, I can take Three questions, and that was uh, that would be about it. I really need to run. So, three questions. 
Okay. Um, who's, I think um, Sahaj has his uh, hand raised for a longer time. So. Um, thanks. Uh, so I'll, I'll keep it really quick. Uh, so Reza, you spoke about uh, uh, how the first three questions are sort of subsumed uh, in the fourth. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, the inverse is also kind of true, right? Like, I mean, you kind of see it with the way sort of capital capitalist structures sort of work, where uh, essentially, who are you is the fundamental question that's asked. Like, you know, you're supposed to define yourself on the basis of identity, uh, biology, uh, you know, community. Uh, the, the self is kind of siloed in that way. Uh, isn't the inverse also kind of true? Like, where, where it does happen, in fact, that's kind of, uh, I guess, uh, if, if there's this kind of game playing there is, out. There is, a, there is a definitive relation here. But the thing is that, you see, uh, again, just uh, a flash forward here to, to future sessions. Uh, you know, after Kant and Hegel's rectification of Kant, uh, Marx and some Marxists uh, become to develop, to reclaim this idea of the human, right? The idea of human as a historical. Uh, and they, yes, they see that, that the, the idea of hum, human, precisely because it's, it's historical, it has an affinity with social relations, socioeconomic relations, right? So there, 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 there are two, a fork emerges here. Those who really think, uh, like me, or left accelerationist and uh, early Gramsci, who thinks that uh, human is own making by virtue precisely of all this historical development, but not in a shallow historicistic sense, that it can make its own self, and that's what essentially man is from a pragmatic point of view or human is from a pragmatic point of view. But there is a different sort, uh, which I don't see uh, is completely opposite in its weak sense to the first sense. The second sense is that if the human is really have this sort of fundamental endemic affinity with social historical relations, then precisely it is the definition of what is a human can be also subsumed within the definition of capitalism. And capitalism ultimately not hijacks really the question of what is the human, but it is really the question of what is the human once understood from an overarching historical, uh, so, so social economic sense. So, and within the question of capitalism, then again, other kinds of que questions happens, uh, you know, whether as Marx understood it, communism is nothing but the self, concrete self-consciousness of capitalism to understand its own, uh, limitation within the historical progression, right? Or it is merely uh, basically the sort of a static sort of uh, basically mode uh, of a species being within which uh, what you might call to be uh, all sorts of uh, calamities and conundrums of race and gender can never be solved. And hence it completely needs to be annihilated from the scratch, right? So, so there are, we, we are going to get into this. And, but, but, but the thing is that we should understand that, look, the only thing that we can do talk about the sorts of different trajectories of how the problem moves and all of these consequences is by creating a fork in a very basic problem and take that fork into other sorts of philosophical forks, navigate the consequences of each of these ramifying paths. And then within our constraints, compare the consequences of taking these ramifying paths and then see if there is actually a way to create a certain kind of point of convergency between all of these paths. Uh, 
So even in Marxism, uh, the question of humanism is fundamentally variegated. It is not just this capitalism, it's not just this or that capitalism. As I said, capitalism really understood correctly from Marx 101 is proto-communism, right? But the thing is that you sh then you should have a certain kind of understanding of the problematics that these people are talking about to say that why is this is the case and not the other one? Why is that we have, for example, this sort of sordid capitalism and not the sort of capitalism that Marx was talking about, right? Uh, but this all comes back to that idea of ramif ramifying the problem. And we are philosophies in the business of ramifying the problem. First, fork from a very single seed, fork it. Then it start to ramifying that fork to create a whole slew of other problems. See if we can actually have a synoptic view of such problems without just simply navigating in one of these problems and not the others. Okay. Oh, thank you. Who has his hand raised as well? I think um, Aaron and Sean. So perhaps um, Sean could go first, or Aaron has. All right. So my. All right. Sorry, so my question is very quick, right? I've, I've loved, I, I love how you've sort of teased out this problematic uh, between philosophical anthropology and the three critiques. Um, I guess the bit that's a little bit unclear to me now is, hasn't this kind of been attempted by, let's say, more contemporary thinkers like Deleuze or Bajou, right? Deleuze very explicitly opens what is philosophy with the statement that um, philosophy cannot exist without the outside. And then Baju also really emphasizes that questions of metaphysics and ethics and transcendence require uh, almost like a, a sort of neo-Marxist uh, uh, affinity with the outside, with the political situation. So I'm sort of wondering, the bit that's unclear to me now is, I, I guess, why are we returning? No, as, as, I, as, I, as I said, as I said, it's essentially the question of a ramifying path, right? So Badiou, um, I'm actually more of a Badiou here than Deleuze, even if I used to be a very a staunch Deleuzean. I would say that, but, but all of such problems uh, are lenses to a bigger synoptic problem. The, the, the practice of philosophy does not concern itself with philosophers, but ver the very fact of historical synoptization of the problem and essentially what we are trying to say here is that the sort of outside, what sort of outside is it? Is it event? Is it contingency? Is it nomenon? Is it really regulative judgment? What is, what is it? And then obviously based on the sort of answers that we do specifically to such explication of the concept of the human, and the trajectories that have arise from it, then we might actually find ourselves at either old paths with some new maps or some new path, new maps with some new territories to be covered. Essentially, we are not in the business here of saying that this stuff has not been talked about. Essentially, we are going to say that majority of this stuff have been talked about in one way or another, but how is it to possible to create a synoptic view, i.e. a truly historical philosophical view of such trajectories or navigational pathways, such that we do not abide by the diktats of one philosopher or another, but we, as always, in the true sense of philosophy, fall back into the abyss of the history of philosophy itself.
Okay, got it. Thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you so much. One more question. One more question. I have to run out. <laughs> so I think um, Aaron, please go on. I guess quick then, uh, or we could start with it next time. But yeah, I just two two like very different texts come to mind thinking about this that I think would be sort of good, sort of if we're all familiar with our base basis to go from. And yeah, I guess I would ask how you would treat Seller's treatment of this and philosophy and the scientific image of man, uh, which sort of does explicitly kind of play out these issues in a, in a philosophical sense before kind of trying to leaves off at where their political implications are. The other, uh, which I'd be curious if you or anyone's familiar with, is a text uh, from a German Catholic theologian, actually also from the 50s, uh, Romano Guardini, called The End of the Modern Age. Uh, Would you that be I able to, I don't know anything about the text. Would you be able to put it on the sidebar, Mark, Aaron? Yeah, I can, uh, yeah, I can. Or send it, so send it us. Send it us. There is one the third text that I actually think that is quite actually necessary. I'm, I cannot believe that I'm actually talking about this. You know, this is not my sort of material. Martin Buber, Between Man and Man. Mm -hmm. Because Buber actually was a fundamental uh, critique, but also proponent of such ideas within the existentialist uh, uh, basically tenant. Great, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll find, if I can drop it in the drive, I'll do so. Uh, yeah, well, there are so many good know. texts here. I mean, uh, <laughs> but I just wanted to, because, you know, because of Pascal, Pascal the reason I actually said Pascal precisely because, you know, um, Pascal's wager is, is quite, uh, is probably one of the most sordidly cursed ideas that I've ever come across. I think that only a man with a demonic mind primed to torture innocent people can come up with such, a, such, a, such an idea. But nevertheless, Pascal in its real uh, philosophical kick is, is actually quite good, is very good. Uh, but yes, um, I would say that Pascal Wager is only designed for people who have some sort of disproportional fear for death. Like, uh, what's that? Uh, John von Neumann, who says that, uh, who's like this great scientist who actually doesn't believe in anything. He's just like an agnostic Jew. And it converts to Catholicism and says that look, I actually prefer uh, to not uh, to not take the chance uh, or the probability of uh, eternal damnation uh, if it require all it requires for me is to convert at the end of my life. I would say that some people can be duped even in the last moment of their lives. Many, many brilliant ones were unfortunate. Yes, yes. No, I mean, we, we are going to talk about word. God, by the way. I forgot about this. This is something that essentially the question of what is man will lead us to question of God in, in a Kantian Hegelian sense. Yes, 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 yes. This is the last one, though. <laughs> the, this leads on to my question. I, Because from what I understand of Kant isn't, isn't the quest for knowledge uh, uh, a fundamental to our human condition? It says that like we can't ever be God, we can't even know God, so we have to try to know God. So it's like if we're made in the image of God, it's uh, is it that kind of return to uh, ecclesiastical thing of like wanting to know God, wanting to know be? No, we essentially we do not even to want to know God. That, from Kant's perspective, knowing about God is is an antinom antinomic problem and hence impossible and should be uh, cast aside. The thing is that we can think about God. Mm. Thinking and knowledge are two different things. Knowledge in Kant's sense is a very a specific sort of category of activity, right? We cannot know God by virtue of 
the very principles by way of which this activity is being primed and propped. We can think about God. We can have believe in God as long as we do not fall in certain kinds of contradictions. Simple as that, right? But I would say that I, as a, as a as as an atheist who is not actually who hates new atheists like Dawkins and stuff, uh, I would say that God is probably one of the greatest uh, topics ever invented. I would say, uh, this is actually, I'm going to, as a teaser for the next session, I would say that God is, the invention of God as a subject matter of great consequence is not of theology, but of human technology. Okay, now, uh, thank you so much. See you, not next week, my apologies. Oh, Philippe, okay. My God, Philippe, you always need to be the last one. No, I was only saying bye bye, Reza. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. If you want to stay, please stay because I'm loving this. <laughs> love you. My apologies. So Nima knows that I have I have a talk next week at their place, uh, Boulder, Colorado. So next week we won't have a class. This actually gives uh, the the volunteers, aka victims, of the first presentation to actually create something great so other people can follow the uh, lead. I will uh, send you a couple of texts, some sections from uh, Pascal and some other stuff, and we won't see each other next week, but the week after. My apologies, sincere apologies. Thanks, Rizal. Okay. Love you. Thanks. And goodbye, Bye. everyone. Bye. Have Bye. a great time. Bye. 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 Thanks, Bye. 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 All the best. Bye. Bye. Thanks.